one thing we do know that really connects these accounts with the underlying neuroscience is that the prefrontal cortex is really important for active maintenance of information over time. This basic kind of working memory ability that we talked about a little bit in the previous chapter. And you can see that here in this recording from the very detailed data set from Summer and Wirtz, and that replicates work by Pat Goldman Rakish, who is a real pioneer in this area among others, uh, showing that uh, you, you have neurons in prefrontal cortex that in this, uh, what we call a delayed saccade task, um, you have this uh, signal that holds on to the location where you're going to move your eyes after a certain delay. So these are kind of delay period firing neurons, and they're just holding on to this information temporarily long enough to bridge the gap between when you're when you get the signal of where you're supposed to look to when you actually have to move your eyes. And you also see in prefrontal cortex neurons that are active when you move your eyes. Um, and other neurons that are active when you get these visual targets uh, and some that, that combine different steps. And so you get really in the prefrontal cortex this critical kind of all elements of the task. And whenever people record from frontal cortical neurons, uh, in, usually in monkeys that are really overtrained to perform different kinds of tasks, um, you see frontal cortical neurons encoding all different aspects of the task. So it's very clear the frontal cortex is very important for, for driving the different steps in solving particular tasks. And we can understand the critical role of active maintenance across all the different kinds of things that we think the frontal cortex is important for. And basically, active maintenance, this ability to maintain information robustly over time, is critical for all the different kinds of tasks. So as we said, uh, this kind of control function, this top-down biasing, depends on the ability to hold on to a thing that you're supposed to be doing, and that's really what the prefrontal cortex uniquely can do, is hold on to it and not get distracted, right? Uh, but when you're planning and you're, and you're thinking about uh, what you need to do as, as next steps, you also need to kind of envision and, and manipulate mental representations of things that are not actually happening right now in the world. And so you need that critical ability to hold on to information and juggle information about things that aren't actually currently there. And so that's another case where active maintenance is really important uh, for, for understanding motivation, tracking progress towards goals. You need to have the goals represented and the current information kind of compared with those uh, and, and decision-making, maintain different alternatives that you're thinking about. So lots of ways in which this basic ability to maintain information is really important for uh, all that the frontal cortex does. And then the basal ganglia um, is really important for controlling that stepwise progress through the kind of problem solving space. Each step in the program we think is kind of triggered by the basal ganglia saying, yeah, that's the next step to do. Yeah, that's the next step to do. Yeah, that's the next one. And so this has been captured in uh, models that really trace their, their heritage back to the classic uh, models from the 1960s uh, that uh, involved this thing called a production system. And uh, modern versions of this, in particular, the ACT-R model by John Anderson and colleagues, uh, incorporates this idea that the basal ganglia is that system called the production system that, that drives each step along the overall cognitive program. And so we can see a real synergy here between the more biologically based models understanding the interactions between frontal cortex and, and basal ganglia and these more kind of computational symbolic models that uh, work like computer programs. And then finally, there's a really important literature on the role of motivation in working memory that connects this theme that we've talked about, about how important motivation is for intelligence and thinking. This data shows that really the main differences between people who, who seem to have a high working memory capacity versus a low working memory capacity is in the uh, extent to which they tend to kind of tune in or tune out. And so this is this idea that working memory and thinking are really kind of demanding of your full attention. And if people during a particular working memory task just essentially tune out, they start daydreaming and mind wandering, um, then they're going to perform poorly. And in fact, that tendency to daydream or tune out 
is accounting for most of the difference between quote unquote high working memory and low working memory individuals. And so that ability to engage and that motivation to engage is seems to be the most important thing, not the raw capacity. And this goes back to this key idea that, you know, whereas in computers, you know, you increase the amount of memory that the system has, and that's how you get performance increases. In people, it's really not the same thing. We basically have the same capacity constraints across all people. There really aren't fundamental differences. It's about that number four, regardless of the person. And what makes the difference across people is the extent to which you're willing to engage and put in that cognitive effort to, to perform these difficult tasks. And so one of my colleagues at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Akira Miyake, found that uh, he was able to predict overall class performance pretty well. And looking at this tendency towards mind wandering and daydreaming, and also procrastination was an important variable. And so another way to think about this difference between automatic and controlled processing also involves the distinction between crystallized intelligence versus fluid intelligence. And so uh, this kind of system one automatic processing, the posterior cortical part of your brain is also associated with uh, all the stuff you've learned over all your experiences. So this lifetime of experience is crystallized into your intelligent kind of internal knowledge. And this is like wisdom, for example. In contrast, the system two ability in the frontal cortex to kind of juggle all this information uh, and, and, and maintain like the next step in the program and, and all those kinds of things with the prefrontal cortex and basal ganglia, that's associated with fluid intelligence, this ability to, to kind of fluidly juggle and, and do the information processing. So fluid intelligence turns out to peak uh, when people are quite a bit younger. Uh, we think that dopamine is really critical for, for motivating that system. And, and again, this kind of motivational contribution, this ability to kind of uh, pay attention and focus over long periods of time uh, and devote the, the effort to doing these more difficult kinds of tasks. That's really what, the, what drives that kind of fluid intelligence. Um, so so uh, really, there's a very consistent set of differences or dichotomies that we can use to understand the contributions to overall uh, thinking abilities.